ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It's absolutely delightful and a great pleasure and an honor to welcome Thomas Bruman to the show today. He is known as one of the greatest rainmakers in the world in the area of festival production and music. I want to tell you a little bit about him because I've been waiting to meet him about 20 years. It just goes to show you that the divine timing is not always necessarily on the timing that we want. Thomas Bruman is currently the project manager of the Southwest Music School. He was the co-founder of WOMAD Festival and Real World Records. He worked for over 25 years as the director of WOMAD and helped organize, get this, more than 175 festivals in over 27 countries. That's a lot of organizing and that's a lot of rainmaking. He currently organizes music activities at the Urban Art Space. He's involved with the Creative Youth Network and is mentoring many young people in the area of music. Many call him a visionary artistic director. He went to school in Bristol, in Argentina, and in Oxford, and he studied literature and language. He loves cinema, writing, literature, travel, and he's a drummer. Some may think he's a Richard Branson because he too founded a unique record magazine publication called the Bristol Recorder. In 2005, the BBC recognized him as the recipient of the world's first Shaker Award as part of the BBC's World Music Awards. In 2008, he made the commander of the British Empire. It's called CBE, which is the Queen's honorary list for his gift of music and charity. When you think of putting on festivals and bringing different cultures of bands and musicians together, the great artists, and rainmaking internationally, take your hat off and give a warm welcome to Thomas Bruman. Thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. How did you get into festival production? And since you've done it 25 years, that's a long time. What is it that made you stay in it so long, do you think? From a very young age, I was completely caught up in music, just absolutely fascinated with it, um, in love with music of all sorts. And although I was never taught music at all, I listened to lots of different music from a really young age, six, seven, and in a way not with my parents' encouragement at all. My father was uh, very keen on classical music and um, German classical song, which didn't really um, get me at all. And my mother liked kind of Cockney songs because she was a Londoner from you know, the East End. But, and I just, for whatever reason, just picked up on pop music. The first single I bought was um, by the Tornadoes, Telstar, very big hit. And I love that. Wait, is that Tommy James and the Tornadoes? No, that, okay, Tommy James and the Chandelles. They were right, bit... but you know, he was a tornado. Oh, was he? He oh, okay. was a tornado. What, did you, you didn't know that? No, no. He I... started off in the Tornadoes. Oh, okay. There you go. I think that must be a, <laughs> an American tornado. <laughs> Because this was an English <laughs> Tornadoes um, produced by Joe Meek, who was wow. this visionary producer. Anyway, so that was the, my first single. And then I think, looking back, it was really influential on my life that I was taken off, as you mentioned, to Argentina, to Buenos Aires when I was nine. And that was in 1963. And at that point, Bossa Nova was happening in Brazil. And so there was like a brilliant... Um, just wonderful, languorous, elegant pop music that was just in the air, as it were, down there in in Argentina. And my dad fell in love with Latin culture, and he was then he started to listen to tango music, so that became a kind of influence. And then during the year that we were away, when I nine turning ten, the Beatles were happening up in Liverpool. Yes, and and all over England, and and. <laughs> You know, in those days, like almost before television sort of thing. I mean, I think we had black and white television. But, <laughs> but and so I can't really rightly remember how, but we were completely aware of the Beatles and their huge impact in Europe. And I was just like desperate to get back. And so we sailed back in the summer of 64. And then when I was 10 and in the autumn of that year, I saw there was a concert at the Colston Hall because then we lived in... Bristol, as I now again live, we're speaking in Bristol folks, and it was a 
concert with Little Millie and a band called the Honeycombs, and a band called the Apple Jacks. And I just thought, oh, I'll go to that. And so I just didn't even tell my parents. I just bought a ticket, walked down to the place went, as a 10-year-old and just went to the concert. That's great. And, um, and it, was, it was great. It didn't exactly move me. Uh, but the second concert that I then went to really, really did, and that was in the same place, the Colston Hall, 1967, and it was the, so then I was 13, I suppose, and that was the last of what they called the pop packages that really ever went through around the UK, and it was headlined by the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and the support groups for Pink Floyd, and a band called The Nice, led by Keith Emerson, and Amen Corner, who were a big number one band at the time, um, led by a Welsh singer, Andy Fairweatherlow, who still playing, still great, and The Move, uh, the Birmingham pop band. So it was just um, this amazing lineup, and especially Jimi Hendrix. It just changed my life, really. And from that point on, I just carried on going to as many concerts as I possibly could, and you could then. Um, it wasn't restricted to kind of over 18s at that point, and it was, and I, I mean, the, the bit I can't... It was innocent time. Yes, though. it was, absolutely was, yes. And also, it was just kind of wide open, where, as I'm sure you know, you know, Jimi Hendrix arrived in this country, and within eight months, he was like a top ten artist. And, and there was just... Stuff happened, and it was so dynamic and, and kind of open, really. And so over a brief period of years I saw so many artists in, in Bristol uh, Fleetwood Mac, Led Zeppelin um, I was, there were uh, Jethro Tull you know all these I'm just I've seen sort of, all of them and love them all <laughs> yeah well just remembering groups yeah. that you know we're going had back an impact. in time a little bit yeah absolutely the birds family mothers of invention Steppenwolf etc etc Pink Floyd again and um and in 1969, I went to my first uh, festival, which was in Bath, just about 15 miles away. And that was a one-day event hold, held at the Bath um, Recreation Ground. And that was headlined by Fleetwood Mac. And, um, and I think it was Led Zeppelin's first ever outside, outdoor gig. Event. And that was a wonderful day. And, and then the year after, in 1970, there was this massive uh, pop event at the um, Shepton Mallet Showground, which is, oddly enough, the place that the first Woman Festival took place. And that was just unexpectedly enormous, um, that where, you know, a hugely bigger crowd than they'd expect. About a quarter of a million kids turned up. And it was this, you know, epic lineup of, um, well, Led Zeppelin, again, they headlined on the Sunday. That's where I saw Steppenwolf. You know, Pink Floyd played on that night. Johnny Winter, um, the Birds played at that, I think, uh, Jefferson Airplane, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And those, so those landmark events, I suppose, for me in the 60s and just to the start of the 70s, it just, it, it just set my imagination. That's what I was completely in love with. And, and I did have these recurring dreams, oddly enough of this particular venue in, in Bath, the Bath Pavilion, where I dream about just being backstage and, and just dream about doing things, but seeing the music from the side of the stage. And, um, and I've thought about it sort of quite a bit since, really, because I'm, in some way I kind of wonder whether or not that dreaming became a precursor of why then that is exactly what I did do. Because by the mid seventies, I'd start I'd, as a young student. I'd started to learn the rhythm guitar. I was really into oh, oh, the Rolling Stones, another great band. I was able to see at the Colston Hall, and so I was really, really into kind of um, blues to, and like quite simple rhythmic guitar. When I got to university, though, um, we'd have our lineup and then a group, and then the drummer always seemed to be leaving. So I thought, oh, I'll just. I'll play the drums, you know, because that'll solve it and we'll have our band and at least we'll have a drummer sort of thing, you know. <laughs> and and I think as a drummer, you just get used to being at the back of the stage. You, you, you just get used to that position of of it being in front of you. And also because you've got a drum kit to cart around the place, drummers tend to be 
more organized. I'm saying that, I mean some, uh, but certainly <laughs> more practical in terms of just getting from A to B. And um, so I was doing all that stuff and then came back from university and I returned to Bristol here to do a further degree, which was um, about middle Scots poetry, would you believe, which was great, but very isolating. And I was still drumming. And then punk rock, talk about, you know, like the Beatles in the 60s, then punk rock kind of happened in 1976, which is the year I came back to Bristol. And, and I was just like, in a way, kind of pretty fearful, but really intrigued, because it was a very, you know, aggressive and hard hitting kind of urban sound. And it, from the outside, appeared like kind of quite an aggressive um, social group, if you'd like. But I went down to a couple of gigs and immediately found it wasn't at all aggressive. It was actually just like a, a bit of a dysfunctional family, really, of misfits and people who were, who were just kind of hanging out and enjoying the, the, almost the glamour of looking different, which you could do in like any way of just like having a few ripped clothes. And, and there was a sense of kind of pride because it was a kind of small subculture at that point. And more to the point that you could just form a band and you can get on a gig more or less anywhere. It was just very easy. And with it, I have to say, I mean, musical standards like plummeted, but at the same time... Creativity. Creativity, yeah. absolutely. Um, just was in the air and in the nature of it. And, and it was that sense of empowerment that, uh, that of that time in 76 to 77, uh, with the bands that I was in, uh, where you just promote your own shows, you just like write your own posters, just stick them up on the walls, and people would come. It just it was great. It was simple. Again, that word innocence, and it and it worked. And and you just sort of collect a bit of cash, and then we thought, hey, I would get a single, and it, and it you know, but with that ethos of just doing it yourself, um, that is what we did. And so by seventy eight, seventy nine, the I started this record label which was called Wavelength Records and um nice title yeah I never, <laughs> never that keen but anyway yeah this was what it was and it was kind of primarily a vehicle for my band and our friends kind of thing so I was in a band with a very kind of unfortunate uh, title of the Spix which was trying to reference kind of rock and roll in a kind of Hispanic West Side Story way. It wasn't trying to be disrespectful of, you know, Hispanics at all. But anyway, and we were good, you know, it was a good, almost like a show band, punk meets soul music meets R&B meets Tamla kind of feel. With sort of good harmony, backing vocals. And um, so we had a single, then a, this lead singer's brother's band got a single out. And so there were basically four singles on this label and then I kind of ran out of money really because I was like cheerfully good at sort of getting things on the way and in production but not really very good at selling the stuff and um and you know you make mistakes really sure. Um, sure. but anyway so that was happening and then at the end of that small period I'd met these um equally kind of unruly sort of student friends, uh, Martin and Jonathan, who had a chat with Dave Cohen, who were all involved in the student union as social secretary um, and a sort of committee that would like to put on the bands. And so they gave my band more than one opportunity to play at the student union. And, you know, we just got talking and we, so we cooked up this idea of the Bristol recorder, which was a, a great idea. It, the idea was to um, use the gatefold sleeve of an album and put inside it a magazine. The magazine would be partly about the music. The music obviously was on the album in the sleeve. And so we were mainly trying to promote Bristol music. And then we were also just talking about subjects that we felt, you know, we wanted to write about. So we wrote about euthanasia, I seem to remember, and <laughs> the Bristol riots and and it was generally a bit of a kind of sarcastic sort of, um, yeah, you know, too clever by half sort of a thing. But but the, the, the innovation was that we were selling advertising space in the magazine. Good for you. And, and, it was, and that was a quite bright idea because we had no money, absolutely zero money, but we'd just sort of go around all the local shops and just sort of 
talk to them, so they gave in and gave us a tell us to go away, sort of thing, you know. And uh, so we brought this first edition out, and then uh, when I'd gone to the studio in Bath called Crescent Studios to record some tracks for the second edition of that record, uh, Peter Gabriel came in, because Peter then has now lived locally, just outside Bath, and he'd come in to borrow a microphone, and I was aware of who Peter was, and, uh, you know, and sort of plucked up courage and just said, oh, hello, Mr. Gabriel, you know, with, with any chance of an interview sort of thing. And, and uh, I was very surprised, I, I think, at the time that Peter said, yeah, I've heard of this Bristol recorder. Yeah, I'd be happy to give you an interview. So myself and a uh, friend, Steve, went off to Peter's house a few weeks later and did our interview, reproduced that in the second edition of the Bristol recorder, and then we had the rather cheeky idea that of asking him to put some of his music on our record. <laughs> How'd um, that go for you? Well, it, it, it went. Yeah, and, there you go. Uh, and, but just because one of our colleagues who I mentioned earlier, Jonathan, was incredibly good at selling things. I mean, he could sell a... Ice to an Eskimo. Indeed. And he rang up Peter's manager and just basically talked her into the idea. And, and Peter was really happy to remix three cassette recorded live tracks uh, from a recent American tour that he'd done, which were great. And so he let us put those on, on our record. So that was all tumbling forward. And at the start of 81, then Peter rang um, our office. I say office, it was like a little basement room <laughs> in someone's house and said, oh, you know, I've been having this idea, he said, about trying to get a group from Africa and putting it together with some Western music so that we can, you know, get a wider audience for African music, which I think, and in the retelling of this, as you can imagine, you know, all these years later, it's very easy just to tell it wrong. And, and anyone who hears this, who knows differently, I'm sorry if I'm describing this I was inaccurately. Say, I think you have a very good memory. <laughs> if you ask me where I was at 10 or 15, I may have to think for a little bit, but it's just coming right out of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think that's good. Thank you. <laughs> you must so, be taking those supplements. Yeah, well, I want right. to know what they are. Yeah. Where am I? What's my name? <laughs> um, so with that as the germ of an idea, basically we started to meet together, um, myself and my Bristol recorder colleagues, Peter as the sort of chairman, if you like, the kind of the, the galvanizer of people. And then this really kind of motley crew, I should say, I mean, a very mixed bunch of people who basically Peter knew and thought might be interested. And from a starting point, therefore, before the idea of a festival, before any question of world music, as it's obviously become known in the years since, uh, we really cooked up all that idea together. So in that sense, I suppose, another example of what you might call conscious streaming, where I suppose anything that you organize or do or create has got to be a thought first. Yes, I mean, that's in a way a truism, isn't it? It's obviously the case. But there is something, when I look back, almost like outrageous about about the um, the what would you call it, the courage, the confidence, the brashness, um, to say, yeah, okay, then we are, we'll find a big space out of doors and we'll invite people from as many countries as we can imagine and we'll just put this together with lots of music that we like and respect from the West. And yeah, why don't we have an education day and we'll invite children and and... So we just had all these ideas over the months of 81, of 1981, and then at the start of 1982, with, again, with just zero money, absolutely no money, I can't, you know, emphasise just how kind of... Bare bones it was. Poverty-stricken it was. Yes, yeah, somehow we managed to... Oh, but, but always with, you know, Peter's great influence and help, of course, and one of the great things that helped was him saying, look, if we get a, um, a compilation album together... He said, I reckon that we could sell it to a major label and get an advance of money. That would help, wouldn't it? So we did that. That's great. That's an example. All of this is examples of rainmaking, right uh -huh. on the ground, boots on the ground. Well, yeah. And so we had this, we, we organized a compilation, which is called Music and Rhythm, 
and it had Peter contributed a track, as did Pete Townsend, um, as did The Beat, who you know became sort of great, well, were already were kind of friends of us in the Bristol Recorder, and so it was a real assembling of everyone's kind of friends and allies, if you like, and um, WBA Records, kind of Warner, uh, were sort of talked into releasing it by these American lawyers that, again, Peter introduced us to, Marty and Stephen Machat, and so this album came out just literally about six weeks before the festival. We got a whole load of money, it was wonderful, spent that instantly along with the costs, um, <laughs> promoted this festival, which very inconveniently um, a rail strike occurred over the same weekend as, and we'd found the Bath and West Showground, the same venue as I mentioned that I'd been to this you know, massive festival at in 1970. And so 1982 was the first time they'd let anything back to the place because the whole locality was so kind of traumatised by a pop festival in the first place. Sadly, we weren't overrun by people in the same way. And it was a rather kind of underwhelming turnout. It was still quite a lot of people, maybe 15,000 over the weekend. But I think... Uh, we needed something like 35,000 to, you know, actually sort of see it through financially. And it just, so it happened and it was this gloriously exciting, I think, and, and re well, great event with some great, great music. The drummers of Burundi came to England for the first time. You know, I'd been lucky enough, lucky enough to see the year before in a kind of research, kind of scouting uh, a visit I'd made to France to a festival in Rennes and we had um, Indian classical music, we had the Chieftains, oh, wow. uh, Peter Gabriel played uh, along with this large Afro-Caribbean drum ensemble from Bristol called Echo May. Uh, Simple Minds supported Peter. We had Echo and the Bunny Men who played with the drummers of Burundi and that was on the same bill as the beat. Were you doing all the casting for who was going to be playing, or was that Peter or both of you? Uh, well, it was it was mainly our office. It was myself um, and a guy called Bob Hooten, who then I worked with for years. Um, and Bob was, you know, one of the the, the recorder team. And uh, but it was throughout all of this stuff, you know, it was um, always a team thing and um, a, almost like a collective, if you like. And although I was kind of allowed to be called like the director of something. I never felt like that. And in a way it felt like almost a, uh, a kind of concession to how the world needed to see things rather than to my mind, a necessary role. And so in some senses, yes, I was in charge of, you know, what happened artistically, but in truth, uh, it was my work and Bob's work and this guy, Steve, who I mentioned earlier, Steve Pritchard with whom I, interviewed Peter in the first place and uh, and, but that was the axis of it uh, I, I would say more than it it being kind of Peter's consistent brainwave if you like it was certainly Peter's sort of influence from the very very start without which nothing would have started but once the momentum got going I'd say it was uh, very much the the Bristol collective that um, that was making this stuff happen. And other great artists, Don Cherry played at that first festival, Rip Rig and Panic, um, and Robert Fripp, and there was a whole gamelan orchestra from Indonesia, a ba uh, Balinese gamelan, I think. And it was just magnificent, all of these things coming together in, in one three-day event, and with all of these school children as well on the first day who'd, who came having made instruments in classes and uh, wearing masks that they'd made, making use of an educational resource that we'd produced. You know, it really was a, um, it was threadbare in some ways, but it was very, very creative, I think, in a, in a heartfelt way as an event. And, um, and, it, and I don't think anything like that had been seen in this country before. You know, there were obviously sort of cultural centres uh, where, um, you know, groups visiting from abroad could play, like the Commonwealth Institute in London was, a, uh, for example, a venue where that occurred, but certainly not a festival with the, uh, you know, the 
disguise of a, of a pop event. And, and I'm also very proud that from the start we were thinking really sincerely on behalf of the audience. We weren't just thinking about chucking bands on in order to get the biggest audience to make a big buck and, you know, be, be rather kind of... Um, kind of superior in a in a rock and roll kind of fashion, you know. I mean, I, that's a bad. It's not very at all articulate. But anyway, we we'd gone to events in the year preceding, and then with all of you know our kind of collective punk rock experience, we'd also played um, at events, certainly smaller concerts and stuff. But what we really wanted was to offer an event where the audience could see one thing and then they could go to a different stage and then they could take part in something and perhaps look at an exhibition. And so it really was a multifaceted event that we created from the very start. How did you know, I just want to ask, how did you know when you, when this, it sounds like a whole evolutionary process, very organic, how you got into it. How did you know you could organize it and deliver it? Well, I think it was just kind of arrogance, really, and confidence. I mean, in one way, but I mean... Because it's a lot to organize. It's a lot. Well, it, right? it, it certainly was. And, and Massive amount of details. Well, it, it, this was before even the, there was a fax machine. Everything that we did was done by the telephone or by letter. And and we genuinely did get 15 drummers to come from Burundi to England. We got... Um, one of Nigeria's pop stars, Prince Nico Mbaga, he came. I mean, and then quite a number of the other visiting groups that they had already been brought to this country by other people, other agencies. Or I mentioned the Commonwealth Institute. Um, I think there was one group that was sponsored by them that, that came in. There was uh, an organizer in Durham who had already brought the Balinese Gamelan that I mentioned. But for all of that, yes, it was a huge undertaking. And uh, and then in terms of production too, we had a, this large indoor venue where all of the, the bigger known stars played. And then we had five different stages around the, the Bath and West showground. And so, and everything that we did was was done off our own off our own bat, um, all of the tickets and the and the promotion and the mailing out. I mean, it, you know, there was no ticket master, there was no internet. It, I mean, looking back, it just does seem a bit extraordinary that we pulled it off, but that's what we did. Extraordinary. How did you get all of the international talent over to one location on a immigration level or on a on a logistics level because that that's huge and that is pre-internet yes pre-fax right yes how did you do how were you able to do that legally and with international relations being what they've been well the era if you like the and that, the decade it was just utterly different and much less surrounded by protocol and and uh process there still was a process, and so with the drummers of Burundi, for example, they, they, they had to have passports, which and which they hadn't got when we began the process of invitation. So, but it was, but it, so for all of it being like a real um, struggle and, and a challenge, it it wasn't the kind of challenge of kind of eighty five hoops that you had to jump through. I don't think it was, it was possible to ring up a um, an embassy. But I don't think that was in Burundi even. I don't think there was one. I think it was in Kenya, and they had to go to Kenya to get visas. But in the first place, they had to get passports. And so how did we do that? Well, just by dint of trying, really, and and by asking for help and asking for advice. And, I mean, that, and, that, it, and that never became easier. It, you know, it's it's always been a process, depending on where you're trying to get somebody from and where you're trying to get them to go to. Right, because it's never just, it's rarely just one person you're bringing a whole band of. Each individual has to have a passport, of has course. to be able to yeah. have permission to travel. and Yeah, and, and so if you're working, say, with groups from Cuba, which, you know, we've you know, have done over the years, I mean, over the years, why am I worked with groups from so many different countries? I mean, I, 
I'm sure I'd just like lose count of the countries if we never we'll try to kind of enumerate them now. But Cuba, there certainly is an example where the, any person concerned needs the permission to leave the country. They need a work permit and you know the and a visa in order to enter the country that you want them to go to. Nowadays, of course, there's a Schengen visa for Europe. We were just talking about that earlier, which in one way is easier because it creates just one territory out of, what is it, 16 countries? I think 27. 27 now. See, I'm rusty. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll still give you a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but in days past, you know, if, if and, and over the years when WOMAD was evolving in the 80s, the way that we would afford to bring over a group, say from Tanzania or from, say, uh, Cuba, <laughs> in order to play at our festival in England, would be then to say, great, they're in Europe, we've got some contacts, as well as playing at the festival, we could perhaps put them on at the Town and Country Club in London, and then we could send them to Vim, who's working in Holland. But, you know, every step of the way is is a process, and, a, and, a, and involving these barriers of protocol and work permits and visas, yes, it's and complicated. It sounds like a lot of the bands got a real lift up to not only to be able to come to Womad and play, but also then the exposure in the country and, and possibly getting into different venues and maybe getting yeah. interviewed. So yes. it sounds like you brought a lot of people that you may have known and Peter Gabriel may have known and your team may have known, yeah. but the outside world didn't know much about them. No, absolutely. Uh, without a doubt. And the effect on some musicians careers was fantastic and then others not as successful as you would have liked and culturally speaking you know um i think at the very start bands were always very excited to come and you know get before new audiences and um i mentioned i think tanzania just now as a country and we've worked with a wonderful artist from tanzania called remy Yongala and his group Super Matamila, Orchestra Super Matamila, and they lived in Dar es Salaam, although Remy was originally from Zaire, and they were Dar es Salaam's most popular group, without a doubt, and a fantastic musical force, if you like, and WOMAD, as a little organisation, was introduced to Remy by um, a chap Simon, who still lives in Bristol, who'd been over to Tanzania, met the group, and he came back with a Radio Tanzania recording of the group, and it just sounds so lovely and flowing and, and, and good. So we, in this kind of usual impetuous way, just sort of got on with, you know, trying to invite them, and indeed they came, and that was the first of something like six or seven years of touring, which every summer they'd come back, and would make a new tour, and as the festival had gone from just being in England to in in other European countries and also Canada they were our part of our kind of frontline troops if you like you know we, we we knew from working with Remy from working with Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan oh, you know oh. a number of yeah. top artists that it was always going to work in a spectacular way because they always did because they were just such fantastically strong artists and so coming back to Remy as an example, uh, we brought them first to England and then we played in Denmark and Canada, I think, in that first, might have been the second year, Germany, France, Italy, Greece, um, and then in years that followed to uh, Australia, to New Zealand, um, all across America. And, you know, there were wonderful times. But at the same time, that thing of just regularly coming away from the country and just touring for two three months each year you know finally began to wear on the group and so you know the time for that passed soon enough um, but in the meantime you know Remy had uh, released um, two even three records I think on real world records through the publishing connections and influence of you know Peter's um, organization which was there in parallel with us but but you know really quite separate throughout all of what I'm describing 
but through the publishing company, uh, Remmer's music was used, for example, on the soundtrack to Natural Born Killers, that movie with Woody Harrelson. You remember, it was quite a notorious movie at the time. And, you know, as any artist will tell you, you know, it's almost like the Holy Grail getting, you know, your music onto the, 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 the soundtrack of a successful film. Yes. And, uh, and so from that point on, that was like giving him a regular income back at home in Africa, which um, before we started work together would have, would have been unimaginable. Well, unimaginable because Remy had never heard of publishing, you know, and, and I think another part of what Womad did and its rainmaking to pick up on the, you know, the theme of the interview, if you like, I think part of a very genuine rainmaking process on behalf of artists was that we began a publishing company as Womad Music in the mid 80s or 86, I think, but before Realwood Records had arrived. And I think that was a really good thing because it's, unless you have um, a publishing uh, arrangement, you can't collect the money as, a, as an author of music in the way that you simply can if you are published, if you see what I mean. What do you think about, uh, you know, in the United States it's BMI and ASCAP for music publishing? Yeah. Is there, there's, there's an equivalent organization here. here what yes, is that that's called? the PRS. PRS. And what do you think about what's happened, the relationship between the internet on music publishing and what's happened to artists on a commercial level? For some artists, they say, like uh, Bobby Lamb from Chicago talked about how if Chicago, for example, was launched today, he doesn't even think they would make it or possibly has, have been as successful because of the music industry structure now, the structure of things, the internet. What's happening with music, iTunes? What do you think? When you say Chicago, you mean the band? As the a, band Chicago. Oh, yeah. well, well, absolutely. Uh, it, it's leveled the, uh, a playing field. And it's also as though suddenly it is a level field, but it's no longer a field. It's a kind of country of level territory. And everywhere you go, there are people in the game, if you like. And so in one way, it's great because it gives access and it gives a, um, a very easy protocol so that, I mean, if we chose, we could make a recording this afternoon, we could send it to iBaby, um, you know, tomorrow, fill in the forms and it would be up on iTunes within two days. And then our chance of a, a cult audience, in a way, is, like, is as large as any other of the umpteen zillion groups that are doing the same thing. Um, I think it's great, personally. I think that the coming back to the motivation and just that zeal of, of, of the punk rock days that inspired me, I think that it's kind of quite thrilling. And it's good, also, well, it's, and it's good because it, it does give artists a voice now that you don't have to sort of queue up in the, you know, the, the, the lobby of one of these um, overfed record companies and just get sort of shown the door because, you know, you aren't this week's thing or, you know, you, you just haven't got what it takes. And which used to be the experience of groups in the 70s and the 80s when the record be companies became, you know, real kind of empires of themselves and behaved like, like bad emperors uh, somehow. And, and, and in that way, the, the I mean, and it still exists to this day, groups are talking about the deal and getting a record deal. And it's as though that is this great achievement. You know, after a long swim in the sea, you, you finally kind of found your way to a platform. Phew, there we are, right now I'm here. Well, of course, that's not the case. You know, having a, an arrangement to release your records with a record company is just the start. Then begins the work of, of building up an audience and, you know, creating a forum where people will actually know about and be interested to buy your music. Now, the, the promotion side of that, I think, is harder and harder, but the, the opportunity that is there for... Getting it out there. Uh, yeah, Getting it heard. Is... Better. Much better, unarguably.
it seems to me that uh, that on one hand the the access getting your work out there is increased to 10 or 100 fold getting your work heard by people who will make the decisions maybe to market your work and to distribute it a whole different thing i was told many many years ago as a younger person that if you were a, a very very good artist it doesn't mean that you're going to get airplay on the radio stations and now with a massive higher distribute you know market distribution of artists that are putting their work on iTunes and YouTube and any other distribution system the issue is how do they get sales yes and while on one hand thank god there's an iTunes thank god there's a YouTube thank god for the internet and all that the issue is how do artists make money today sure. what's your take on that well that it if that's your love Right? Yeah. You really, you know, you really have this gift, and not just the love, but and you, you want to bridge your passion, your gift, and the ability to prosper. What would you tell artists today? I'm sure, you, as a mentor, you must be telling them something. Maybe it's a secret. I don't know. No, no, it's, it's no secret. But okay. at the same time, it's a process of advice, I think, and of guidance that it would take hours and hours for us to talk through you know properly and 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 helpfully and so granted yes it's not easy but it, there again it never has been and what it always has been to do with is hard work i think and ambition and artistic courage the the willingness to fail perhaps as well you know and overcoming the fear of that but a to be creative it's where it all starts it's where it all, in a sense starts and ends it is and that's that's why so many people are so passionately engaged in it because music has in my opinion real spiritual power you know real the the real ability to change people at uh, a profound level and certainly it's in countless ways to change mood so we care about it deeply without music where would we be it's the universal language that's what uh, really saying, yeah. yeah absolutely but so not to get too distracted by that as a, as a subject so <laughs> so to be in it you've got to make it and so that's step one and so if you are making music and perhaps your own songs or your own um melody with two other trumpet players whatever it may be and then you go out and you find an audience of some sort well an audience can be found on the street then it can be found in a bar then it can be found in a club and there are there are many 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 opportunities to find an audience um, which exist for genres and types of music of all sorts everywhere around the world and part of what I do with the mentoring thing that we mentioned a couple of times is uh, I uh, organize workshops where we um, talk about a map of an industry and uh, and the purpose of the workshop and which can last from two to three hours sometimes even a whole day depending on the audience and the young people that are engaging with it when basically tries to describe for the the people there um, we first identify as many genres of music that exist in this terrain if you like and we write them down on a very very large piece of blank paper right across the top so you know hip-hop blues classical folk you know african and so forth and so on and within about 10 minutes of the thing starting you've got umpteen forms of music described across this bit of paper at the top and then we go right, okay next let's at the bottom of this sheet of paper let's identify all the audiences that exist that listen to all these forms of music and again it doesn't take a, a genius to be able to enumerate maybe 30 different um, environments or different audiences you know which may be live in clubs and bars and halls and then of course digital and uh, in terms of film and television 
And already, even before you then started to kind of um, map out all of the threads by which the music at the top reaches the audiences at the bottom, even quite experienced musicians would be, oh my goodness, you know, they'll be surprised by how complex the territory is. And, and in that way, well, it's quite daunting, yes. On the other hand, it is also full of, full of opportunities. And something that I've been trying to communicate and teach to young people in, in this work of mentorship over the last years is that On the face of it, music may seem to be this like great citadel of difficulty where getting anything done or achieved or successful is so hard. On the other hand, as um, a skill um, or as a, as a language um, and an area of work, mu music and musicians have many transferable skills, many, many transferable skills. And the, the first you can easily identify is this thing of teaching that, that sharing a, the passion that a musician, a creative artist has in the first place um, is a great gift and something that can inspire younger people, whether that be from, you know, guitar lessons or uh, singing lessons or compositional uh, lessons, you know, whatever. And then in the industry, in terms of uh, record companies, uh, promotion that which is how I've earned my living through my life and you know the programming of artists in a, in a, in a live arena uh, record studios um, the media and all of the work that goes along with bringing music onto television and into film and onto the radio it just goes on and on and on and there are thousands of jobs that and just activities then if you like that that are needed, and that's I think the, the the important bit of the vision that I hope young people will take away from mentorship stuff that I'm involved with. It's not as though it's like a you know some kind of remote possibility. Someone has to do all this stuff, you know, For sure. <laughs> and it could be you. And um, so, very long answer to a question many minutes ago, but you were saying about values and and the necessary stuff in all of this. And yeah, so how, I, do, how do artists find their way? If they want to make money with their art. Then they've got to have art that people want to listen to. They've got to be hardworking and really consistent in just pushing and promoting and being active. Uh, they've got to, and in that sense, they've got to be ambitious, I think. And then yes, there is more than a pinch of luck involved. And, you know, even, in the decades where it was as though it was some kind of like science of promotion there were, you know the the you know like the history of music is is just like littered with these not littered um it's featured in many ways by these stories of accidental success you know the b-side that one dj happened to kind of listen to and play that suddenly became the enormous hit for whomever you know what i mean i did an interview with tommy james last year and he had written a book, Me, the Mob, and the Music, and about his story. He didn't know it as a young young guy. He signed a deal with a, um, a mob family, head of a mob family in New York, and they kind of lorded over him for 25 years. But anyway, he was talking about in early in the book how everything he was doing in music, he was heavily promoting, heavily promoting. And a lot of times I think with artists that I've read about and talked with, a lot of times artists think their job is to deliver the art but not to deliver, to make yeah. sure that the art gets to people yeah. that need to hear it, see it, read it, yes. etc. And that's a kind of a missing piece, it appears. Yes. Well, and artists come in all shapes and sizes in a way, and some, you know, take the thing of self-promotion like a duck to water, and then at others it's just, you know, absolutely not their thing at all. When you mention that this artist, that's Tommy James, as in... Tommy James and the Chandals. And the Chandals. Yeah. The, I love the single Crimson and Clover. Yeah. I absolutely love that. It's so out there and different and memorable. 
So I'm very impressed. That <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say like hanky panky or crystal blue persuasion or moany moany. <laughs> True. Not, or I think yeah. we're alone now. <laughs> another great, another great yeah. tune. Yeah. But uh, so that's a, the, yes. So that getting the work, the artistic work, yeah. to move forward is the other part of it. And I thought yes. The Creative Youth Network is different than the music school. That yes, it is. With. Yes, the, the distinctions are two. Talk, well, talk to the audience a little bit about the two. Okay, the Creative Youth Network. Well, uh, is a charity that uh, used to be called uh, the Kingswood Foundation, and where we're speaking from is in, in my house, and which is in Kingswood, and it's a suburb of East Bristol, quite working class, and. Uh, the Kingswood Foundation, uh, which you know was the title of the charity, which is the thing that I got involved with several years ago, wa um, was essentially offering uh, opportunities for young people to express themselves. It's, uh, it's, so the, the, the belief of the, of the charity is that every young person has a voice and a gift of some sort, and that every young person deserves to be encouraged and to be supported in self-expression in whatever way may be possible. And so I got involved in the organization running music workshops and they, uh, and on a weekly basis um, out at Kingswood, they also org had um, hip hop and uh, so, you know, modern break dance workshops. They had like graffiti, uh, visual arts generally, um, more formal dance stuff, etc. So a whole kind of like platform of, of different evening um, classes, mostly for free. And then for young people, teenagers, uh, who had been excluded from school for whatever reason, with the urban art space, um, the opportunity for young people to come, not be just like told off and, and kind of put back in a corner, but actually encouraged through creative arts to, you know, do some stuff and that with it, great. find their way back to school. So the Kingswood Foundation then retitled itself Creative Youth Network when we acquired or bought as a charity the, a premises down in the centre of Bristol, which is called Bridewell Island, which is a very large, um, almost like some city centre block, just by the, by the, the, the bus station where you'd have travelled into earlier from Glastonbury. <laughs> And we're busy He's giving way too much information about me. <laughs> <laughs> Edit backwards, everybody. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to tell your address. Okay, no, go ahead. <laughs> so, just close to the city centre, we've now got this marvellous uh, premises, um, about eight tenths of which have still to be renovated and brought back to kind of cultural life, if you like. But as part of this block, that that the that our charity has now acquired is a thing called the station, which is three floors of activities and facilities for young people. So there's a, um, a really good performance space for about 450 uh, as an audience. There's a dance studio with a sprung floor. There's a recording studio. There are practice rooms. Um, then there's um, advisory um, services at the top of the building for sexual health, mental health. So it's like a real hub for young people and that's great yeah absolutely very inspiring and we're just now how uh, young do you have to be to get in that auditorium <laughs> <laughs> well the, the 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 intake as it were the uh, of uh, of the charity is 16 year olds through to 24 so it's quite a narrow window of of young experience that we're focusing on and a new thing that um has is just being initiated I was saying earlier, we were uh, just interviewing just yesterday for um, people to take on and to creative roles with, with the charity. It's a thing called an Artistic Excellence Programme, where we're hoping to take at least 20 people per year and give them a really quite intensive uh, process of um, encouragement and mentorship and training and artistic development and with four areas actually involved music which is my thing as you can imagine dance photography and visual arts and fashion Fantastic. yeah and and there are some such 
really, really uh, lovely, bright and engaged young people who are at the minute, you know, we're, we're um, selecting and, and trying to kind of place um, as mentees with mentors. It'd be really interesting to see what happens over the next, you know, two, year, two years and more as this program rolls out. So it's a great organization led by a chap called Sandy Hall Ruthven, who's a brilliantly proactive and successful leader and getter of grants and and he you know he changes people's hearts and minds as they say he's a wonderful guy and um uh, the the growth of the charity is very largely because of sandy's you know great leadership he's a rainmaker yeah it sounds like it. should go and speak to him i think i will <laughs> Plug Sandy, yes. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. I, I love the name of the network, Creative Youth Network. Yes. Very inspiring and direct, mm. yeah. direct, creative. It's said that a lot of younger people who get into some type of difficulty, and whether it's with school or with the law, have not had their creativity activated properly yet. Yes. And directed. Yes. And it sounds like it's a great place to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's precisely. What do you think about the X factor, like where some music and finding young people and all that is, has gone? What's your take on it? I'm sure that uh, it's a double-edged sword for some, but what, what's your feeling about it? I think, as you just said, perhaps it is exactly that, a, a double-edged sword, where on the one hand, you can't gainsay the, um, the positivity of some of, a, of an auditioning person coming from obscurity and frustration driving a van around Northampton or something and 14 weeks later being a top 10 pop star sort of thing on the other hand it's a process that I think uh, tends to put a spotlight or a, or a, a magnifying glass too particularly on commercial success as a yardstick of achievement and by the nature of success and the top and then not the top everybody can't be as sex successful as everybody else and I think the um, there's a distortion of values I think that does go along with with the process and again I mean I think in truth with um, all of the really um, I was going to say successful artists, but then I should stop myself because what is success? Um, artists of real conviction and of real power, if you like, their craft and their achievement doesn't come from being auditioned and, and just, you know, like meeting Robbie Williams or whomever for, a, you know, a couple of weeks. It comes from years and years of perseverance and of improvement and of artistic development. And, uh, and, with artists who really are there for the long road whether they've got a hit record or not it's a road that does continue and i think that while this extremely success oriented process of the x factor or all of these other competition shows whereas it may be of inspiration to some young people thinking oh yeah i'm singing in my bedroom i'll be that person I think it's it, it makes almost like a cartoon out of it and uh, a very distorted impression of how things really, you know, mostly do happen. And after all, even when somebody has just been risen, you know, been sort of given that platform, and whoa, up they go into the public eye. Five years later, you know, you ask, you know, the, any hundred people that you might meet, have you heard of, I don't know, you know, Jim McGrath or whomever and it's just as likely that person will have just like disappeared off the face of the earth you know um, as I, in yeah. I, I asked you that question because while I enjoy it I, all, I often wonder because it's television and because there's a very limited bandwidth of people that can be accepted yes. as, as quote the top it's even more narrow due to the nature of the focus of the show. And so it's like taking a massive amount of bandwidth and then taking a small bandwidth 
and asking that massive amount to fit through the small bandwidth, you're still only going to get a very, very small amount. Yes. And so in that way, it distorts who's successful and it takes away the organic process of evolving into that space. Yes. So the meta message of, of the X factor is the issue. The meta message underneath subconsciously to young people is if you don't make it, you're not a winner. Yes. And you're not successful if Simon does, or, or the team doesn't say you are. And yeah. that's the mistake. Yes. It's the meta message. You, you agree? I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. Much more coherent way to put <laughs> No, I, <laughs> I just process. wanted to make sure I, 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 I heard you correctly. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us today about your, your, where you are now, just in wrapping up where you are now, and where, where you're looking to be in the next, I don't know, five to ten years? If there's anything you can share about where you're at right now, because obviously you've done so much already. Well, I just hope to be happy and healthy, and I feel at the minute very happy to be working in this very different way, as I've been telling you about with the mentorship that I, that I do. I, I still enjoy programming music, selecting artists to you know perform in different venues and I, I work for a lovely venue in Salisbury called Salisbury Arts Centre and that's a real um, real pleasure for, for me and it's enough to kind of feel as though I'm still sort of got my kind of hands in the washing up sink of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of music and its activity Sooner or later, I would love to be able to initiate another uh, festival idea, but the last six, seven years have been really very much the wrong um, economic climate for that. And I suppose really also the truth is that as a person, I'm much more careful, much more restrained now than these, those rather impetuous times that we were talking about earlier. But yeah, I think more than anything, I... I really, really like engaging with teenagers um, mainly, or, but young people, however you may define that, who have clearly got a talent and with encouragement and this mentoring process being of significant um, help and support to them, you know, at a time when perhaps things aren't very clear and where, you know, you can easily just sort of, you know, give up the chase. And I, and I, I really want to kind of pay forward, if you see what I mean, and just to share knowledge and and inspire other people. Oh, you do. And I want to thank you for being here today. Would you say it's rainmaking time with me? It's rainmaking time. Oh, it's rainmaking time. But it's rainmaking time. Is it? Okay. <laughs> it's rainmaking time. Thank you so much, Thomas.